My guest by way of telephone is Anna Roundtree, and her name had come up to me several times, and I was up in Moravian Falls, North Carolina, at a uh, uh, a leader's idea exchange with a friend of mine, Rick Joyner, and sitting opposite me was a man by the name of Stephen Strang and his wife, uh, Joy, and and they're the uh, editors of Charisma Magazine. Uh, and uh, Stephen kept looking at me. He walked up. He said, Sid, I think you're supposed to meet Anna and Albert Roundtree. And I said, well, their names come up before I'd like to meet them. So they arranged for me uh, to, to meet um, Anna and her husband, Albert. And of course, there was an intriguing portion. And that intriguing portion is that Anna has had literally <laughs> hundreds of visitations to heaven and has recorded it so accurately. In fact, let me read this um, uh, from her book, The Heavens Opened by Anna Roundtree. And this is by Gwen Shaw, the head of End Time Handmaidens. The Heavens Opened is an amazing and beautiful revelation of the place that he has gone to prepare for us and where we will spend eternity. Of the many recent books written about our future home, none reveal so clearly the glory of God that awaits us if we are faithful to him during the days of testing that many have already begun to experience. You will read it more than once, and you will want to share it with all your friends. You will not be able to put it down. Now, when I went over Anna's home, I found out things about Anna, and I, 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 I went there with uh, Stephen and uh, uh, Joy Strang, and, uh, and Joy was saying, boy, I didn't know those things. Anna, you actually wrote the uh, film script for uh, Stephen King's first movie? Well, that, that's, that's exactly right. Uh, I, I withdrew after, the, uh, uh, after writing it and uh, took my name off of it because after I wrote it, I, the Lord told me that I was going to be marrying a minister, and I, um, I didn't think that that sort of material would be uh, right for uh, um, a minister's wife <laughs> to have written. Believe me, I didn't think it was right. Now, the circumstances of you uh, marrying a minister were pretty interesting. Uh, you were uh, being prayed for and uh, being baptized in the Holy Spirit, speaking in unknown tongues. And what did God tell you? Well, he, he told me that I was going to be marrying the uh, the minister of that church. Now, now, how does someone walk up to the minister of that church and say, well, God told me I'm going to marry you? Oh, you don't. <laughs> Believe me, you don't do that. In fact, uh, the Lord said not to say anything to him, that he was like a man asleep, that he was going to say something to him. and uh, And he did. It took a couple of months, but he it, he did. And uh, out of curiosity, did he uh, did God sovereignly tell him, or he just was attracted to you? And no, 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 no. Well, he and I were not attracted to one another at all. Uh, we just, um, you know, in the natural, we weren't each other's type. Now you must realize that when I was working on the. Uh, the, the first draft of the uh, screenplay of Carrie, I was not saved. Um, I'm sure that as a saved person, I never would have done it. But I was not saved. The Lord brought me into the... That was a horrible movie. <laughs> it's a... Oh, heavens. It's, it's uh, you know, my, my generation was traumatized by Psycho and uh, this other generation, uh, the time of when Carrie came out. Uh, in the 70s was traumatized by Carrie and and uh, I mean it's a it's a ghastly film but what I was trying to do in the film was make it so real that it would be possible you see and um, the, the producers allowed me to they wanted it changed from the location of the book which was Vermont from Vermont to a small Texas town 
and I had been from Texas, and I said, I haven't lived in Texas in years. If you'll let me go to Texas uh, and sit in Texas, in a small Texas town, then I'll, I'll write this for you. And um, therefore I did. And that's when I met my husband. He would, They were having these meetings on Friday night. Now, your husband was involved with, uh, he was a pastor out at Church of the Redeemer in, uh, was that Houston? Yes, he was one of the two, uh, uh, of, of the two clergy of that. Uh, now, that's that's the place where, within a church, the charismatic movement really got started. Yes, that's true. It's it's very, uh, it's it's well known as that. In fact, like the uh, vineyard up in Toronto and, and like Brownsville, uh, the world came to uh, Houston to to take a coal from the altar, you might say, and take it back, and it uh, uh, ignited fires many places. Uh, what was the catalyst that start started the move of God in that church? Uh, do you know? Well, I believe it was actually God himself that did this, but uh, it wasn't known to anyone. What he did is that he gathered together uh, 12 people, two of them were clergy, um, who prayed every single day. And one of them had to drive over from Galveston to uh, to pray every day early in the morning. Um, it was a church that had what they call a crypt or a, a small chapel under uh, in a basement, you might say, in, in New York. It's down in the basement. But um, uh, they would come together in that that particular chapel and pray. And uh, they knew that the Lord was doing something because he had moved within them in such a way that compelled them to come together to pray. He had brought them together. And... Uh, and he ignited from those prayers this uh, wonderful uh, outbreak of the Spirit within that church. And it just, uh, wonderful music came from it. And uh, my husband said, he said, you know, our, our mouths were just filled with laughter. <laughs> Sounds like a psalm to me. <laughs> yes, <it does. laughs> they were like children uh, because... The grace was so great and the outpouring so mighty. He said, we, we would just ask for anything, and we knew that the Lord would do it. Oh, wait, that went by too fast. Did you catch that, Mishpucha? They just She just said, we would just ask for anything, and the Lord would do it. Yes. Yes, that's right. It, it was an extraordinary period of time in everyone's life. Of course, everyone thought it would last, you know, um, that, that it would go on and on. Of course, it did spread everywhere. It was a mighty move of God. Um, but as with all of the moves of God that have happened in the past, uh, they get corrupted. They, uh, they just don't last. Uh, now, I'm going to jump a little. Uh, you got, obviously, you got married, and a lot of interesting things happened with the ministry you and your husband had. But then you met a man by the name of Bob Jones, who is a friend of mine. I've got a funny Bob Jones story. He's a prophet, Meshbucha. And uh, I called him once on the telephone to interview him. And I, at that time, I was living uh, in the Washington, D.C. area. I was actually in uh, Gaithersburg, Maryland. And I said, uh, hi, Bob. My name is Sid Roth, and I'm from Washington, D.C., because, you know, who's heard of Gaithersburg, Maryland? And he said, I can't talk to you. And I said, why can't you? He said, because I'm waiting for a call from someone from Gaithersburg, Maryland. <laughs> I said, well, that's me. Uh, so anyway, this Bob Jones has had so many amazing visitations and trips to heaven. And I understand you met him and you decided you wanted to write his life story. But you had a problem. What was that? <laughs> well, uh, it's actually, I, I think the Lord answered a prayer because of that. We we had been in Kansas City and we were um, 
interviewing him, we uh, putting it on tape, his life story on tape. His life story is really very interesting. And uh, uh, we were taping him and uh, also going out to eat. I'm not sure which we were enjoying the most, <laughs> taping or going out to eat together, but we were having a wonderful time together. But uh, I would ask him, because he would go to heaven, and he said, well, I went to heaven and such and such, you know. And I'd say, well, Bob, um, what does it look like up there? And he would say, well, you know. I said, well, I, I really don't know. Believe me, I don't know. I said, are there colors up there? Do you see colors? I mean, is everybody dressed in white, or does anybody have on something that is a different color or, or something like that? And he said, well, you know. And I thought, oh, my word. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, finally, um, after we finished all of the taping, I, I really told the Lord, I said, Lord, if, if you want me to write the story of this man's life, and he's going to heaven all the time, and I don't know what heaven looks like. And well, you're just, you're going to have to take me to heaven. I, I need to see heaven myself if, um, if you want me to write this. I said, but I just ask one thing. I don't want to have to be smashed up in a car or something, you know? I understand. <laughs> <laughs> Could you just do something a little different here? <laughs> you know? So, uh, did, did you think he was going to take you to heaven when you prayed that? No, no I didn't think so. <laughs> no, I did not. But do you know, Sid, um, almost from the beginning of the time that I was saved, if anyone with a prophetic ministry saw me, they'd say, well, you'll be seeing into heaven. I have on the telephone Anna Roundtree. I'm speaking to her at her home in Moravian Falls, North Carolina, by way of telephone. And um, I have a copy of her book, which I've just read, The Heavens Opened. On yesterday's broadcast, we found out that uh, she was writing a book on Bob Jones, a prophet who had been to heaven many times, and she felt well, I can't relate to this because I don't know what heaven's really like. Not realizing that God was listening. And since that time, she has had hundreds of visitations to heaven. And she literally will put a hunger within you to taste heaven. And I asked her before we went on the air, and I said, anyone that pays the price that's a believer in the Messiah, can they go to heaven? And what did you say to me, Anna? I said absolutely, and in fact, more so nowadays, because Sid, I really believe that though uh, this book and some others, like Rick Joyner's and and others, are are forerunners. Uh, it's it is you you keep using the word provoke you to jealousy. It is to provoke one to jealousy to seek to go on. I believe that the Lord is bringing. Um, uh, every all of the believers into a uh, a place where they can communicate directly uh, with him. Uh, let me ask you a question. We we had said we had talked earlier about this off the air, but uh, what what was known as the charismatic movement that your husband was a pioneer in okay. um, that's pretty much finished, isn't it? Well. You know, I'm, it's simply my, uh, an opinion, but I believe so. I believe it was actually finished in uh, uh, 1977. And, um, and what we call the renewal movement at uh, Brownsville and Toronto and uh, lots of other places, it's still going on, but I don't see the same degree of changes in people like I did at the beginning and it's almost the same as the charismatic movement. So we're kind of in between moves of God's spirit. But you know what's going on in the heavenlies. What, in your opinion, will be the next move of God's spirit? Well, I think it's going to be so entirely supernatural. Of course, he, it, it's always supernatural. But um, I don't think it's going to be as tied to a church or um, 
something of this sort. I really believe that the Lord wants to uh, call people directly to himself. Um, what I call uh, calling people to the garden. I think that uh, we're trying to aim for the wrong thing, Sid. I think we're we're aiming for the early church, or oh, well, you and I have discussed this. Well, I'm a, as, as you know, Mishpacha. I'm a Messianic Jew, a believer, Jewish believer in Jesus. And you, and and Anna and I were talking about this, and Anna said, "You Messianic Jews don't go back far enough." And I said, well, "Well, what do you mean? We go back to Moses and the Torah and the biblical festivals." And then she said what she just said to me. We don't go back far enough. How far should we go, Anna? All the way to the garden. Um, that's when there was no division. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> that's right. There is no division there. And uh, You mean before the fall, of course. Well, uh, really, yeah, before the fall. But even uh, just the Lord walking with Adam and Eve in the garden. It sounds so pure and so wonderful. It's, uh, he wants that kind of intimacy. And uh, he wants us, um, as it says, set your mind on things above. And we have become uh, so earthly minded here that we don't understand that what we actually need to do, said, is that we need to live above and commute to work on earth. But we have gotten very centered, earth-centered, uh, which uh, Paul warns us not to do, but to look above because it shifts um, uh, onto, it throws everything onto the Lord then. When you, when you live above, you know absolutely that things must shift to him and you, your flesh starts getting out of it. <laughs> you see? It, um... but, but Anna, it's easy to preach it. Now, you and your husband are living this. You're out in a beautiful, because I was in your home. Uh, I almost got snowed in, as a matter of fact, <laughs> uh, in, in Moravian Falls, which has a, is a story all unto itself. But the average person, the pull, uh, well, let's just be candid. The pull of the world, uh -huh. the pull of the flesh, uh -huh. uh, the, the pull of this life, um, without some supernatural help, how do you shift out of, out of that pull to, to just be so single-minded? How does someone do this? Well, uh, during the time that, that these things were uh, began with me, uh, said, my husband took uh, an interim pastorship in a in a Presbyterian church in the Panhandle of Florida. We were down in Florida, and uh, it was a, a small church. And in a small church, um, it actually keeps you big, busier than a big church because uh, you must do everything: visit the sick, uh, teach, preach. Um, do all the things with the children, and uh, besides, you know, going to uh, getting to know everyone and <laughs> helping with corning season, which is, you know, shucking corn and, and uh, snapping green beans and things like that when you're out in the country. And uh, so we were incredibly, incredibly busy. We really were. And um, these visions, I was having these visions anyway. What you must do is that you must want God more than anything. You must say to yourself, uh, as I believe you have said, there has got to be something more. And that's very much what we said to ourselves. Um, after we left working with the pastors in Kansas City. There has got to be more. We have seen revival. We've been in three revivals, in fact. We have, uh, we have seen the pastors coming together in, in unity and love. And as glorious as that is, there has got to be something more. And uh, so we, 
we left to go find the something more. We wanted to know what the more was. And once you get in a, in a heart pursuit of God, he will raise up to meet you on the path. He will say, this person is seeking me, and they are desirous of me, not desirous of supernatural uh, squiggly things that are going to make you feel uh, wonderful and excited and, and uh, disappear like Chinese food. No, the person is seeking me. They want me. When you seek God, then the other comes with that. But it's in the pursuit of God himself. It is, it's a catch-22. Is God waiting on us or are we waiting on God? Well, I believe that he waits to see if you're going to do it. I mean, he, he gives everyone so much already. And we certainly aren't grateful, you know. I mean, we're, we're still too titillated by uh, knowing this little mystery or that little mystery. Speaking of mysteries, um, I, I asked you a question. Um, do you ask the Lord questions? Do you ask him all of these mysteries? And I'm amazed that, yes, you've asked a few questions, but you're really not interested in that when you go to heaven, are you? <laughs> really not. What, what are you interested in when you go to heaven? I mean, I've got all sorts of questions about healing and about end times. And I, I mean, I would sit down with my little notebook like a reporter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's so uh, amazing just being there. Even, even though I, this is more mind-blowing than anything, one becomes accustomed to it because you have been there many times, you know, and so it doesn't just just rattle you every time you go. You, it's like home. That's like home, and here is almost like a foreign land, <laughs> you know, but here is where you are sent to work and serve the Lord, but uh, up there is home. And now, you wouldn't do my television show. Why wouldn't you do my television show, Anna? Well, I know it sounds strange. Uh, I know it, but but the Lord asks us to be hidden. And uh, uh, when you see a face, then you start getting this personality along with it. These books are absolutely his books. They are not ours at all. I had no idea I was going to write a book at all said, all I did was record the visions. No one was more astounded than me when, when the Lord said, I want this in a book. And I thought, I said, but who would read this? <laughs> who would believe me, Lord? That's the better question. Not who would read it, who would believe it. <laughs> yeah. Who will believe uh, that this is true? But all I did was uh, find out what he wanted and lift right straight from my journal what had been recorded and put it into the book. All I did was just join them together, you know. Uh, of course, a lot of them weren't in there because there's just too many of them. Uh, but that's all I did. So what you have... But this book's going all over the world now, and you're not even promoting it. Well, that's right. Anna Roundtree, I'm talking to her in uh, her home, which I've had the privilege of being in with her uh, husband in Moravian Falls, North Carolina. And uh, it was when I was there, the snow was coming down, and it was just the, the trees were there, and the air was clean, and it was just so enjoyable. Anna's been blessed to go to heaven hundreds of times. And she's recorded it in a book, The Heavens Opened. Now, Anna, I promised on yesterday's broadcast that I have so many questions. Uh, you know, anyone that's been to heaven hundreds of times, I've got lots of questions for. But one thing that I have heard from others that have had visitations to heaven, and it, it kind of intrigues me, and that's the parts room. 
Uh-huh. Did you actually see this? Yes, I did. Tell me about it. Well, it was uh, very bright in it, and there were there were different parts of, of bodies there. You would think that it would be gruesome, but it wasn't. It was uh, it was like a hold a place of holding it, uh, like a distribution center. I, I guess you might call it something like that, a distribution center, and uh, they were preparing to make these parts available to people. And like uh, you you also told me that you saw angels in school, so to speak, for the next move of God's spirit of the miraculous. Tell me about that. Yes. Yes, they were they were training um to be um to accompany believers on earth for the uh next move of God in a healing revival. And um they said that there would be two angels this time with each person who would be receiving this gift. And there were hundreds, nay, thousands, I would say, of angels that were training, and that was only uh, one training that I saw. I'm sure that there were other trainings going on, or there had been those who had already graduated, you know, and were were uh, with the people then. Uh, you, you, you say in your book that the Lord was really sad over the uh, say the, the the last healing revival uh, uh because the the people that that had this gifting didn't disciple others and and just kind of uh used it for their own benefit yes yes the the angels were uh some of those angels that were with uh those particular ministries uh told about that that they that they were sad. That's what they were saying. That that they are very saddened, and for this reason, the Lord was going to give two angels uh, with each person this time, and and there were going to be many more because there were not that many in the last move of the Spirit for healing. I mean, a, a great move of God, not just. Uh, well, let's face it. Even today. The, there are not that many that move in the miraculous in the United States. Well, that's right, because it, it really takes the Lord initiating. And uh, we can have people who move in power here and there and who have gifts of healing when they're under the anointing, and uh, they're here and there. And But uh, for a great move of God, only God can do it. <laughs> Uh, I'm reminded, I, I had the privilege of uh, knowing Catherine Coleman, and she used to tell the story of, she said, I won't be here, but a day is coming in which uh, Christians will go into a hospital and clear the whole hospital out. Do you see that? Yes, I do. I, I think that things are going to be completely so extraordinarily uh, miraculous. But we we must prepare now to to be containers to hold to hold that glory you might say because uh, everyone just sort of waits from and, and hops like bunnies or something from one move of God to the next but they are unwilling to go through uh, the cleansing and the maturing that the Lord needs to truly hold the greater anointing. Okay, Anna, I consider myself a great cheerleader for God uh, and, um, and an encourager. And, uh, and, and uh, I want people to know how to get from step A to step B. Uh, one of my big problems in life is I have a very logical uh, type of mind, and that's in faith that sometimes is a problem. But kind of be a coach right now. Tell me how to get to that next point, and we'll let we'll let our mishpocha eavesdrop. How do I prepare? What should I be doing, Anna? Well, I I think a lot of people ask that, Sid, um, when the answer is just painfully simple. You know, it's seek God and be obedient. It's do what He says in the Word, and desire him more than life itself well let, let me ask you a personal thing yeah. um, I didn't happen to notice I wasn't looking for it but 
Uh, do you and your husband watch much television? No. Um, is someone that, say, gets home at night and is a form of unwinding, watch sports or, or listens, nothing bad, you know, news, and spends a few hours every night just relaxing before the television, is that something that uh, God might want us to lie, put down? Well, you know, each person is, is in an individual place before God. Uh, we uh, actually got digital television up here. And we thought, oh, this is wonderful. And we we got it and, and you know, had it connected here because we were interested in it for the news. Um, and as we looked at that, even the news, it was the the visual part of it, you see, <laughs> that, that visual, it, it uh, uh, we used to hear radio uh, a, a lot, especially those of our age when we were growing up, and, and uh, it did not consume you as, as uh, the visual and the, uh, the audio can. It can consume you. And we disconnected it. We, we didn't have it even a month. And that was for the news, you know. But that's us. That's where the Lord has us. We don't feel, said that we've got time for that. Look, you know, we're down here, not for ourselves, but for him. But wait a second. You're not running all over the country speaking at conventions. You're not doing television. Uh, I think it's miraculous that I even have, a, have you on radio. So what are you doing with your time? If you're not watching television, you're out in the woods with, with this, you were snowed in for a week. What, what are you and your husband doing with your time? Oh, my gosh. We barely have enough time. We have, uh, we must be with the Lord, and we have to pray. Many people want us to pray for them, and we do. We don't just say, I'll pray for you and, and walk off, you know, at the supermarket. We actually put that down, and we listen for God, <laughs> and we study the Word. My gosh, there's almost not enough time to do what we're doing now. We we don't know. We, we say to ourselves, how did we have the time to, to pastor that last church? I mean, we're just <laughs> blown away that we had the time. <laughs> um. When when you go to heaven, uh, uh, is it a dream? Is it a vision? Is it uh, you just in prayer? I mean, uh, explain to me the last time you went to heaven, what you were doing, and 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 how in the circumstances. Well, uh, it's it's all so different, but um, I would say uh, I believe it was John that says I, I was there. You know, or and Paul said it also. I was there. You are there. And uh, I mean, are you just close? You just close your eyes and you're there. Is that what you're saying? No, no, no. I I wait for the Lord to uh, to let me know that He wants me to come up. All right, the Lord. Let's. Uh, all right, the Lord I says. Pray, I pray and uh, worship Him, and if He wants me to come up. Then he will uh, tell me to come up, and he provides the way. And there are many ways of going up. One of them is is through a tunnel, and sometimes he just lifts you up. And sometimes you go in different ways, you know, stairways and things of this sort. I I have a, a theory, and I it was certainly not told to me by the Lord, but there are fifteen ascents in the in the Bible. And I think there are probably 15 main ways of going to heaven. I think that they were really, the what was given there in the Psalms was much more supernatural and with a greater knowledge of the Lord and, and uh, than, you know, that, than we have of, of what is there today. When, when you go to heaven, how long might this take? Well, you mean just just traveling there? Or? No, not the time to travel, but the uh, uh, the visitation uh, is well, a. Sometimes they last five hours. Okay, is your husband ever in the room when you go to heaven? Well, he was the first time. 
now not because uh you know i just i set aside the time uh to uh to do this but he was actually there the first time i i was uh taken up into heaven so it's, um on, on tomorrow's broadcast, I want you to tell me a bit about the first time you were taken up into heaven. Uh, was it scary? No, no. It's just that I was I was uh, not sure that it was uh, what I thought it was. I, I just it was very different. Uh, I had seen angels down here intermittently. I wasn't seeing angels all the time, you know. And uh, I didn't address them. They didn't address me, and I just see them. But uh, this was one who, uh, an angel who addressed me and required me to do something, you know. What did he require you to do? He, he said, come forward. And uh, there were these curtains that were, uh, I could only see the first one, an angel standing beside the, the opening in the curtains, very very thin, and there was light coming through them. They were blue. My guest, by way of telephone, I'm speaking to her at her home in Moravian Falls, North Carolina, is Anna Roundtree. And uh, most people have not heard of her, but she's had hundreds of visitations to heaven, and God instructed her to write it in a book. And although they haven't met her, her books are getting around, literally, around the world. Uh, and uh, what they do is they g increase your hunger to know God intimately. Increase your hunger to not miss what God has for you in this life. And, and one of the things, Anna, that, that kind of, uh, well, overwhelms me uh, is with all of your visitations to heaven, and with being a writer, which you are, and God's used your gift for his purposes, um, I'm just amazed that you don't have your pen and pencil and, and, and are asking thousands of questions. Instead, you say, you don't want to ask him any question. You just want to be with him. What is it like to be with the Lord? Oh, it's, oh, it's the most wonderful thing in the world. And to be with the Father also. It is, um, I mean, such such pure love. It's very healing love. Had you ever experienced that type of love this side of heaven? Oh, absolutely not. No, no, nothing like it. Believe me. And, and truly, uh, we come from a background that didn't believe that you could know the Father. Uh, you know, he says he lives in, in unapproachable light, and uh, he certainly does live in unapproachable light. But I believe that not knowing him had to do with his faith. Uh, I believe the Jewish people understood that. You cannot see my face. The, seeing the face is really uh, knowing more about the person. But uh, you certainly can because many people in the Bible saw the Father on the throne, saw his hands, his feet, his uh, the clothing. So um, other people have seen um, these parts of him, but not his face. Now, is there a difference in the love that you actually, from a feeling viewpoint or experiential viewpoint, that you feel when you're with God the Father versus God the Son? Well, uh in a way, no, but in a way, yes, because he is the son and he is our eternal husband. We are betrothed to him now, and uh, and uh, it is possible that we can also go into a formal betrothal with him. And the father is uh, very fatherly, you see, and, and he acts like a father and reacts like a father, and uh, the son uh, acts and talks in a different way. Uh, they they have different personalities, but as far as the essence, no, because uh, the Lord emptied himself, it says, 
in order to receive everything from the Father and let that pass through him to others. So his expression is only what the Father shows him, only what the Father gives him to give does he give. He laid that down before the foundation of the world in order that 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 love of the Father and all that the Father had might pass through him. I've got a question. In, In your teaching on the betrothal, which is very, very important. Yes. You actually talk about things that are in a traditional Jewish betrothal, not the wedding, but the betrothal itself, like, a, ta- right. like a talit, and you talk about what's known as the, the chuppah uh, in the wedding. And uh, Did you see these things in heaven before you found out they were part of uh, traditional Judaism? Oh, goodness, yes. Yes. Did, did you actually see a talit, a prayer shawl in heaven, and the, and the chupa? Yes. Well, uh, the the father uh, made that canopy over uh, us with his hands, so mm. he was the canopy, and it was the joining of the father and the son and the Holy Spirit at the same time uh, in this deeper commitment. So um, the the three were there, as three and one and one and three were there uh, during this period of time, right at the same place. And uh, so, but I, I only, you see, when this happened to me, Sid, uh, I mean, it was the most extraordinary thing, um, and I only shared it with my husband because I had never heard of anything like this in my entire life. and uh, But it didn't make any difference. It was a very private thing that I put into my journals, you know. Not realizing that the whole world would eventually <laughs> be able to read it. I had no idea that the Lord was going to say, uh, after the first book, I want you to, you know, write this. Uh, Anna, second book. Anna, I'm going to get some people upset, and you don't want that. Oh. Uh, you've got to tell me about your first experience of going to heaven. Oh, oh, my first experience. Well, <laughs> that was with Albert. <laughs> yes, he was sitting. We were praying. Um, we had, you know, you mentioned Bob Jones, and uh, we, Bob Jones had given us a year before. Uh, a prophetic word. Now, we have known Bob Jones all these years, but he really doesn't prophesy to us. We're just friends of his, you know. Uh, but at this, right before we left Kansas City, he was at a, at a party, um, a dinner party, and he gave us a prophetic word that during, well, he didn't say when it was going to be. What, what he did is that uh, he said that we were going to have a visitation and we would be in a cabin. And then uh, he had a young person come over and kneel down right beside him and said, Now you look at them and tell me when they'll have this visitation. And uh, the person said, I see two headlights kind of things. He said, Yes, and what else? He said, I see it like a tree with lights on it. And he said, So when will they have the visitation? And, of course, none of us, we were just as dense as we could be. And he said, Hanukkah, the Feast of Lights. Well, he did not know that we had booked a cabin in uh, Arkansas, and we were going to be in it at Hanukkah. But it didn't happen at that Hanukkah. It was the second Hanukkah, like the two lights, for two years. Well, you must have been uh, very disappointed when it didn't happen. <laughs> well, we were, you know, I mean, uh, Sid, we were sitting in these straight back chairs facing the front door because we didn't know what a visitation looked like. <laughs> I mean, uh, we just didn't know. We we just sat there during Hanukkah facing the door, and we, you know, we said, well, this is about the way it is with us. You know, we don't ever have anything unusual happen to us. <laughs> and uh, the, the next year we were, uh, Albert was in Kansas City to teach for the pastors up there, and someone who was at that party said, are you ready for Hanukkah? 
And uh, we said, well, we didn't have a visitation. They said, no, this Hanukkah, two lights. Remember the two lights? And we were in a cabin in Texas then. <laughs> and uh, uh, when Hanukkah rolled around, we were just sitting there praying. I must say we weren't in any great uh, belief that anything was going to happen. We prayed like we prayed every day. And uh, suddenly, as we were praying, I saw this angel standing before me. And, and the angel was standing in front of a very, very tall, light blue curtain from, that had light behind it. And uh, the angel said, come forward. And I got up in my spirit. I'd never done that before. I got up in my spirit and followed that angel. And the two other angels parted the curtain. And we walked through that curtain. And there was another curtain beyond that. And uh, after we went through the first curtain, I began having a internal argument with myself. I said, this can't, this, you know, this can't be a visitation. A visitation is when Jesus comes to see you, and this can't be a visitation. And the uh, angel said, stop putting up his hand like that, stop. And uh, so I was arguing with myself, and I said, well, you know, I, even though this isn't what I think is a visitation, it's not something that I've done. I, I think I'm just going to go on and do it. <laughs> you know, and the angel said, come forward, because he read my thoughts, you mm. see. The, the next set of curtains were parted, and I walked through that, and greater light was behind that, and then the third set opened, and... There was nothing but blazing white light. And I knew, though I saw nothing that first time, that I was in the presence of God the Father. And a voice came from all that light, and he said, what would you have? Well, I didn't know what to do but to continue praying what we had been praying every single day, he said. I mean, that's what we were praying every day. And let me tell you, we haven't prayed that since. Because I would pray a few things, and he would say, done, uh, proceed. And I would just go on and pray those other things, and he'd say, done. And I thought, my word, I am standing before someone who can say they can actually do what I am asking here. But I wasn't, like, proclaiming it. I was simply talking to my father. Well, I'd really like this, you know. And I asked, oh, well, when he said done, were they actually done? What it meant was that in the spiritual realm, it is done. He is un bringing it about, you know. Hmm. He is, you know, bringing these things about. Because could, could you give me an example of one thing? Well, we were we asked for uh, more of the gifts of the spirit, you know. There's one thing. He's bringing that about. Uh, we wanted more of Christ. And that's not done in a day. <laughs> My guest, by way of telephone, no doubt, is red hot for the Messiah. Her name is Anna Roundtree. I'm speaking to her by phone at her home in uh, Moravian Falls, North Carolina. Anna has literally had hundreds of visitations to heaven. And um, I can tell you that uh, some very, very well-known spiritual people have become friends of hers and uh, just say the most wonderful things here. I have a quote from Suzanne Hinn uh, about her book, The Heavens Opened. That's Benny Hinn's wife. In this exciting book, Anna Roundtree will help to take you beyond the veil into a realm where holiness, obedience, and unconditional surrender are the qualifications that will take you into the very presence of the Lord. She shares the importance of living a life of worship that has caused the heavens to be opened in her own personal life, bringing fresh understanding of the angelic realm that has taken her 
into the very throne of God. Anna, you were explaining on yesterday's broadcast the first time you went to heaven, an angel showed up. It was, it was on Hanukkah. You were in a cabin. It was actually prophesied this would happen. Uh, and, uh, and he escorted you up to, the, uh, to, uh, to heaven and take me from there. As, as I was telling you, it was um, the the Lord was saying after I would ask him something, he would say done, and then proceed or continue or something of that sort, and um, I, I just kept uh, going on till I got through all those prayers that we all were that we prayed every single day together, you know. So I was praying them out loud because. Um, my husband could hear me praying these out loud, but he said he could tell that my voice changed, that I wasn't talking, sort of pontificating. I was um, talking like I was talking to somebody, and of course I was. And um, at the end of these prayers, of all I could think of, um, the father said, step forward, and I did, and he laid his hands on me. And he said, I mean, these hands of light came out from all of these blazing light. And, and uh, he said, receive. And, uh, and that was it. And the angel started taking me backwards. And I thought, oh, now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, you know, you don't think you can dig your heels in in heaven, but that's what I was doing. I was kind of being drug out, but I was digging my heels in because I had heard that people that uh, that died only got one shot at this. I said, oh, no, you only got one shot. What if I'd forgotten to ask for something? And I've just got to ask for something. And the Father said, the way is open between us now. And if you have forgotten to ask something, you can ask me any time. He knew what you were thinking. That's right. And uh, then I went out with the angels, and we went back through those curtains. But instead of the angels being very businesslike, as they had been before, they were smiling and very, very, you know, very warm then. And, and the angels have been very warm since that first encounter. They were, they were rather, um, I guess it was an official... Uh, you know, thing that they were doing, and so they were being official. <laughs> what is it like to go in your spirit to heaven? I mean, it's, I guess there's, it's a weightless feeling, almost like an astronaut in space. Well, yes and no. It's, it's such a natural thing that, that you really don't think of it like that, like going, you know, <laughs> like that. <laughs> you, you just, it's, it isn't like that. It is, you have a spiritual body that is, ex, it's like your, your natural body, except that it's the age of your spiritual self. So that when I went to heaven, I was older than 20, but I was only 20 years old in my spirit, and I went as a 20 year old. Oh, so in other words, each person, is it the number of years that you've been a believer when you say age in the spirit or how you've matured? Uh, I, I don't know. All I know is that I was a 20-year-old, and, and the maturity between the first and second book has to do that I'm, I'm older in the spirit, you know. I'm, now, when you went to heaven, did you see anyone you knew? Yes, I, yes. I, I've, I saw my father, um, and I mentioned that in the second book. I do not speak to him, but I saw him. Now, why didn't you speak to him? Uh, he was in a crowd. But did he, did, he re, did he know you were there? He saw me, and I saw him. Yes. Did he smile at you? Did he wave at you? No, he didn't wave. Uh, uh, the the uh, circumstance was too formal for, for waving. But uh, I saw him, you know, and, and it was a... It was very um, satisfying to see my father there, but I don't. I don't speak to uh, to the humans. I haven't been given to speak to humans. Uh, the Lord has me speaking and and telling about heaven and how people are trained 
by angels and uh, by the Holy Spirit, by the by the Son, and by the Father Himself. Speaking of training, um, tell me about this next move where where you said there'll be two angels with specific men or women. Will this be thousands of men and women that'll move in the miraculous of healing? Yes, I believe it will be very general. It will be uh, very, very general. And how far off are we? I don't know. Oh, I wish I did know. <laughs> it would be wonderful if it was tomorrow, wouldn't it? Well, I'm, I, I happen to believe it's closer rather than further away, which means I hope so. well, we've got to be making up for some lost time. <laughs> Yes, that's true. But I, you know, like a buildup of water in a in a pipe, because we have been between uh, great moves of God for for so long, uh, I think that the buildup is going to uh, that when when He comes, He is going to step down and and crack more than sideboards as he did in the uh, Welsh revival. He's going to crack our hearts and things are going to be uh, very different. Whether we will hold that, though, um, I, I just pray that we will hold it. Now, what about the average person that's listening to me right now that's not in ministry? That uh, Can they be part of this next move? Can they have the intimacy you have? Can they go to heaven? Oh, my gosh, yes. And I don't really think of myself in ministry. I was a, a minister's wife, but um, that's the way I spent uh, most of my married life with my husband. I was simply a minister's wife. I, um, you know, I would teach the children and uh but i i was not the uh the leader or the uh i i wasn't what i would say in ministry i'm i'm very surprised that the lord would use me at all i i honestly feel that uh i'm really sort of like the least in fact uh when we went to um arkansas and we're in that cabin that i told you about um in the mountains over that first Hanukkah, uh, I said to my husband something that I said, I I wish I had an anointing. And he said, well, Anne, who are you to have an anointing? Now, if he could say that to me, <laughs> <laughs> you know. I understand. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's, now, when the, when the miraculous anointing hits us, and it will soon, very soon, I believe, I believe that it'll be so strong that people won't have to meditate on healing scriptures for 20 years and confess it and 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 do a, a checklist. Have I done this? Have I done that? It's just anyone in the presence of that anointing is going to get healed. Absolutely. It's um, when the anointing of the, comes from the Lord, in a, and especially in a great outpouring, uh, it is so entirely supernatural. Uh, you don't have to hold your mouth right. <laughs> well, have you ever been in that in that type of an anointing where everything that you ask happens, everyone is healed? Um, I wouldn't know if everyone were healed, but I write about that in the in the first book. I just uh, allude to it, you know, that uh, that we had stepped into that kind of an anointing, and it was entirely supernatural. And uh, and it lasted for a period of time, and and people were healed of everything. I, I they were healed of all sorts of things. I wouldn't know if it was everything because these people were on a prayer board. I mean, we they didn't even have hands laid on them. We were simply praying. Boy, I'm looking for that day. Yeah, we were just praying for people that were on a prayer board, but the Lord U came unity the anointing. Is... Unity is so important. Well, it is, but there is a, a great a misconception concerning unity, and uh, there are different circles, you might say, of unity. And um, I think we're to be tolerant 
and uh, loving of everyone. But when the Lord intends to do something, he will bring the two or three together. Or, as it was in the Redeemer, for a major move of God, he will bring 12. Um, Something like that. But it's very hard for that many people to be in absolute unity, their lives in complete unity. Um, But the two or three, uh, he can do that with two or three. And those, when those are in unity, when he's brought them and they are in unity and they are obedient to pray, he will do miraculous things. But, um, and it, it benefits everyone. You see, it benefits everyone. It isn't like an exclusive thing. They may be the, the match that, uh, that the Lord uses, strikes the match, you might say. Uh, he might use those prayers of those individuals. But for everyone to be in that kind of unity, um, I would say it's impossible, you know. We do have some very um, sort of childish ideas.